This is X. St. Anderson. Welcome to the Principal Podcast. I am thrilled today to have on my show Susan Schwartz. And Susan has been kind enough to join us on the show today. Um, thank you for being on the show, Susan. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about what you do. Yes, I'm um, an analyst of Jungian psychology. And that means that I talk with people about their problems, but also really the meaning of their life. And, you know, in a certain way, what's the purpose and how do we make sense out of the things that bother us, where we've been hurt in our life and how we grow from it. And within that, uh, over time, I've noticed and made note of the absence of fathers. And so it became an issue to explore. So that's kind of why I wrote the book, The Absent Father Effect on Daughters, Father Desire, Father Wounds. What I have found, and you might know as well, the issues of the difference between absent father to a daughter and absent father to a son is not as important as the absence itself. So they're all going to suffer if they don't get the presence of their dad. Thanks for sharing that. You know, I was looking at some statistics here. I found them on the Rochester Area Fatherhood Network, and they were referencing fathers.com. And here's some of the statistics that they said um, about how important it is to show up as a father, be present, as, as I think you're saying. You know, it says uh, here, it says 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. Um, 71% of all high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. 90% 90, 90 of all homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes. Now, this does not mean that if your father was not present, that you're destined to have these problems. That doesn't mean what at all. But it does mean that if, for those of you who are fathers, Realize, I mean, let me re re read a few more of these really quick. It says children with fathers who are involved are 40% less likely to repeat a grade in school. Uh, children with fathers who are involved are 70% less likely to drop out of school. Um, a lot of, we've, they, they found that a lot of uh, people who are in prison are, are it's very oh. highly associated with, with, with fathers being absent. The father is, uh, you know, for those of you who are dads who are listening, to show up and be there is so important. Would you agree with that, Susan? Totally. I think that, uh, again, our culture, families, country have really lacked the presence of father. And it's gone on for generations. And we actually, the more aware we are and the more we show up, the more we can correct the issue. Even I would say in psychology, so you're quoting something on the internet, but psychologically at the beginning of psychoanalysis in the early 1900s, the starters of anything analytical or depth work, they didn't have very close fathers, hardly any of them. And so we've got an inheritance and very little has been written in the professional literature about fathers equal. So then we learn to ignore it. How many people say, oh, he wasn't there. And then they go on, not going, wait a second. Why wasn't he there? I need a father. Was he open? Did he come home and say, hey, how are you doing? Just that alone would help so much. I'm interested in you. And I think we have suffered from not, we all know psychologically, if that space isn't filled by some kind of father figure, we're lacking. I mean, it's again, doesn't mean you can't be successful. It doesn't mean you can't be all right, but it means you've got an absence that you want to deal with. So let me ask you this, Susan, what would you recommend as a way of being present, you touched on a few things there. What would you recommend to our listeners today about how to be present? You've mentioned the word present more than once mm -hmm. in our conversations. And I like that word. How do I be present for my children, for my kids, for fathers listening, for their children? How do I be present? Can you talk about that a little bit? 
you know, it's both difficult and simple at the same time. So when you encounter your child, why don't you give them a hug? Why don't you say, how really are you? Are you ready for school today? Can I help you with your homework? Are you struggling with your friends? Aha about, are you happy? Let's sit at the dinner table. Let's talk about what you did today. Did you win at soccer? Did you lose? What's going on? And will you ask me some questions as well? Because I want to tell you who I am. I love that. So it's not enough to just be sitting in the same room to be present. It's actually, we need to be present with our thoughts. We need to be present with the questions we ask. We need to be present with, with how we say the, the questions, be really there rather than just say, well, I'm in the same room, but I'm checked out on my phone or I'm kind of distracted by the TV or we're watching some film, something on the computer. I mean, actually be mentally present there for our kids means makes a huge difference. Am I hearing that correctly? Yes. And you know, it's, it's, um, it's a feeling, actually. You can feel it. When somebody is really interested in you, it, that gives you interest in yourself. If you're interested in yourself, you'll learn about taking care of yourself. What about dads taking care of their children? What about the dad being the one that bathes the baby? What about not waiting for the mom to tell him, would you? No. This child belongs to both. So what about both participating? And that models for the child union. It's very important. So when they see an outer union in a way, and I, you know, people that are single parents can still do it as well, because you know, we don't want to say, you know, they're or single fathers that they're that they're without union. They very well can be as long as they really bring the child into their world, bring the child in. If you're sitting there on your phone, you're not bringing your kids into your life. Right. Yeah. So let me, let me ask you this. Um, why do you think fathers have been absent? Well, you know, for centuries, for centuries and for generations, it was all right that they were the providers. That was their role. We were all caught in kind of rigid roles, fathers too. And they had no model for how to be a related dad. I mean, dad went off to work. Did they see him? I don't know. Did they do anything with him? So many people say, yeah, I talked to my, they didn't talk to their father. They were with the father when the father was doing something. That is different. They weren't with with. They were just like, would you get the hammer? And the child gets the hammer. Does the father say, you know, I'm doing something. I want you to be here with me. We can talk and I can show you how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's a very different. Well, it's, it's not necessarily bad to do things with your kids. I mean, obviously that's a great thing. And also... You know, this this uh, idea that men can provide for their families. In fact, I think I, I still think that's a good thing to do is I, I feel that providing for my family is, is a great thing to do. But if that's all I do right. and say, OK, I, I'm providing so I don't really need to be checked in. That's not enough. Right. I need to be a father who I, I, I personally like to provide for my family. I think it's a great thing to do, but I need to provide for them, not just financially, not just with physical things but also emotionally, I need to provide for them uh, spiritually, emotionally, and let them know how much I care about them. It's not enough just to say, well, I, I brought home a paycheck so that you should be, you should be okay, correct? That, that's exactly what I'm saying. The other thing is that you asked me um, tips. You know, one of the tips that classically, sadly, I think men have been deprived of is their emotional and father's their emotional and relational expression. So if a father would say to his child, so what did you dream last night? And if the child would say to the father, let's share our dreams. What did you dream last night? Mm -hmm. That establishes so much of a connection, value 
for what's going mm -hmm. on inside, how one feels, being able to express. You know, the studies on health say the more you're in touch with your emotions, the healthier you are. You don't get so sick. So this, this presence of the father helps the body and the psyche of the child and of the father as well. So show, asking deep questions. What did you dream? Or how, how was, how was your day? Tell me how you're feeling. Tell me what you're yeah. experiencing at school. Tell me what you're, what's going on where I'm really checked in, not just, Hey, it's good to see you or Hey, I'm home. <laughs> really, really showing interest. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. And, 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 and me, about deep emotional things, making it safe to, to talk about emotional and deep things. I think so, because that's where we learn, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it's where we learn. The, the, the other thing, of course, is that um, the physical expression towards children. So this is one of the things that fathers kind of, this is what I've heard from their children as they talk with me. And these children are adults, for sure is that the father at a certain age um, does not deal with them physically, especially, I was going to say, especially girls, not really, also boys. So many males say, oh, well, there was this time, you know, my dad and I had to hit him or I had to beat him up or whatever. And the, which is awful because there wasn't communication, you can tell. And with the daughters, the father cannot express his own confusion because he sees his daughter growing and quite lovely. He sees his son growing and quite lovely as well. And he doesn't know how to express his appreciation for their individual being. If the father could say, oh my gosh, you are looking so great. I'm so proud of how well you take care of yourself. How um, amazing you are. Don't you think that child would be, oh my, so happy. And so with the dad. But how many fathers really learn, hey, that's safe. That's okay. That's You're okay. All right. Yeah. It's and and, more it's, than and it's okay to give your kids big hugs, even as they're growing up to say, hey, I love you. It's good to see you. Exactly. You know? Why are we so afraid of expressing our real feelings, our, I think what I'm saying is the value of expressing one's intensity of being, intensity, N not angry intensity only, but intensity of love. Right. Yeah. Tell them you love them. Say, I love you. Whoa, or, at least once a day. I'm so grateful that you're in my life. Have a big hug. Welcome home. Tell me about your day. Tell me what you dreamed last night. Tell me how you how school went today. Tell me what you're thinking. What are you feeling? That kind of thing. Just being interested. Yes. It's such a big I, difference. It is. I think there's another thing also, which is being the, the father being sensitive to the emotion of the children as they grow. Because, you know, we all have days that are not so good. And our self-image maybe plummets a bit. And we need support and help. Not to be talked out of it, but to really be with it. You know, it's not to solve the problem of the children, but it is to be there. And that's children of any age. You know, I mean, you can be 60 and your parent be 90. And, you know, there's an ability to really talk and express, not solve the problem but be there with the issue. It, even if it's difficult issues, anxiety, depression, whatever, but for the father to be aware helps the child learn to have self-awareness. I love that. I love that. You know, I got to tell you an interesting um, thing that as a father kind of surprised me. And, I, you know, I had my daughter come to me and she wants, she knows that I like to hike, hike, hike mountains. And she said, Hey dad, I want to hike this mountain. Now I, I live near some very tall mountains and she knows that I've hiked. Uh, there's a certain mountain that I've hiked quite a bit. Well, this mountain happens to be 11,700 feet high and mm -hmm. she's five years old. And she comes to me and she says, Hey dad, I want to hike this mountain. Now I got to tell you, my first impression was, you know, you're too young, but she said, dad, I really want to do it. I really want to do it. And I said, you know what, if you want to do this, We'll do it. Let, let's talk. Let's talk it through. 
your feet are gonna, your feet might hurt a little bit. You might be tired. Do you think you'd want to do it? And she said, I want to. Well, we ended up hiking that mountain together. And I got to tell you, it was fun to see it. We hiked all the way to the top. There were people on the, on the, on the trail giving her high fives saying, wow, what a trooper. Wow. I can't believe you're up here when she got to the top of this mountain. And again, this was an all day hike. I mean, we were all day long. She got, she got a standing ovation at the top of the mountain um, because here was this five-year-old hiking this massive mountain and she loved it. I think that built her confidence. It kind of built her saying, you know what? I can do things. And, and I could have quashed it. I could have said, well, you're too young, but we'll do it when you're older. And I think sometimes our kids can surprise us. You know what I mean? She, she actually did it. She hiked to the top and it was, you know, we're talking 15 miles round trip somewhere around there and uh, Ooh, great experience, that. great experience. And I think being, being willing to say, you know, and obviously as a dad, I, I feel like it's my job to protect. Obviously I wouldn't want her to do things that were, were extremely dangerous or if there wasn't supervision, I'm not saying you should do with any of that, but, but I am saying sometimes our kids can surprise us with what they're able to do. And if we can kind of unleash that as a dad, it's almost like we can help build that confidence in our kids. Yes, but you see also what you're expressing is confidence in yourself as a father. So the confidence goes both ways. So she knew, just think of as the way you said the story, she knew she could come to you and present this idea. So already there's freedom. I can come to my dad and I can say, <clears throat> I want to do this. And the other piece is you like to hike. So why should she not model herself after you? Right. Good. Go for it. Absolutely. And your approval of that makes her also strong in her body and in her psyche and in the connection with you because she shared a huge experience. She'll never forget it. You know that. I'm sure. She'll, oh, she won't. She won't. The, the reason I say that is that um, so often people of quite a bit older than your daughter will say, you know, I remember when I was five and this is what happened with my dad. So she, that's why some of the stories are not so happy as yours, sadly, but she'll remember. And that will give so much to her. And you will have that story to tell all kinds of people about you and also your daughter. Hmm? Well, this is a great experience. You know, I, and I think a lot of times kids, frankly, are about as confident as their dads teach them to be. So let's, let's give them confidence. Um, let me tell you one more thing and, and ask your opinion on this. You know, I think sometimes as parents, we're tempted to do sometimes too much for our kids. So I like one thing of this you said before, which is don't solve the problem for them. Um, and let, let me give an example of that. You know, if, if, a, if a child comes to me and says, Hey dad, I want a peanut butter sandwich. Well, the truth is I can make a peanut butter sandwich in about 10, 20 seconds, you know, just put it together and here you go. And, and I may decide to do this sometimes, but what if I were to just, you know, I remember also, what if you were to say, you know what, do it. how do you think, how do you think you make a peanut butter sandwich? And they say, well, I need to get some peanut butter and jam and, and well, do you know where the bread is? Yeah. You keep it in the, in the pantry, but do you know where the, the peanut butter is? Do you think you could find a little spreading knife and do it? And, 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 and you could sit there and walk through it. It might take 10 times longer for them to do it themselves, but when they do it, they feel confident because, Hey, I did this rather than mom or dad just did it for me. Um, letting our kids not solving the problem necessarily, but allowing them to do it to gain the confidence um, instead of just, I mean, tell me your thoughts on that. No, I think you're absolutely right. I, and quite sadly, the amount of people, we deal with the absence a bit, the amount of people who don't have a dad who will say, do it. I have confidence you can do it. There's the absence. And then we learn, uh-oh, maybe I can't. But you see in that story that the son could definitely make the peanut butter sandwiches. Who knows? He might become a chef. He might become a who knows what? That from that one experience of success, he might. Your daughter might climb Mount Everett. I mean, you have no. So it's like what will happen in the future is very important. We're laying seeds now, not that. just for the future, for the present and the future. I love that. I love that you that you teach people that those little things we do as as parents, as fathers, really can make a massive difference in the future. It is. There is another thing too, which is that the dad being able to look at the children and being able to critique 
in a healthy way. Talk about that. Tell us, tell yeah. us your advice on that. Well, you know, it, when you see your children going to school, perhaps if they're little or big, whatever, and they're kind of not put together well, wouldn't you want to make a comment? Like, you know, how are you feeling? Because you don't look like you're too well put together. In other words, not just from the outside, but, you know, are you okay? Because I see that maybe you're not. And I want to know how I could assist you to make this day okay. So it's like noticing the details that kids want to be noticed. Kids of every age, we all want attention and people to really see us well, not just the outer, but the inner. I love that. Yeah, it's the inner. Here's, a, here's another, uh, tell me your opinion on this, Susan. I, I read a book once and, and the, the premise of the book was that behaviors are like seeds and attention, as you were talking about, is like water. In other words, as a parent, if I'm trying to inspire a certain behavior, I want to really be keyed in to things that the children are doing that are showing effort, where they're putting forth effort or doing things, you could almost say doing things right. And so if my, you know, for example, if my child uh, it puts in a lot of effort to study math, well, that's a behavior that I think would be helpful and help them in life. And I could say, wow, I love the amount of effort that you're putting in trying to figure out that math problem. Or, you know, they made their bed and got ready for school and got put together, as you're saying, and say, wow, you've made your bed and got ready for school. And I didn't even have to ask, wow, that's a really, I, thank you. And give them attention for that. And the premise of this book said, you know, the, the behaviors we give attention to will grow kind of like seeds. Whereas if I'm, if I'm on the other hand, let's just say I'm pointing out the negative, you know, you've seen a, a parent walk, the kid walks in and the parent says, I can't believe you stayed out too late and you didn't make your bed and you're getting bad grades in math and you're doing the... And what they're really doing is actually possibly making it so those behaviors are more likely to occur rather than saying, wait, I'm going to really be keyed into the positive. So one of the things that came to mind when you said this was, you know, if, if I can be present to the point where I'm actually saying, wow, you just, wow, you're playing nicely with Johnny. I love it how you were playing. You're being so thoughtful together. And I like it the way that you, you made your bed. It, look, it looks great. I didn't have to ask you. Thank you. That's great. Or I love the way you put in the effort of making that peanut butter sandwich or whatever it is where I'm catching them and praising positive behaviors rather than, you know, I think it's easy as a dad to key in and say, well, this is what's going wrong. But what if we were present enough to say, I'm, I'm going to catch my kids doing something right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Instead of but, but you see, what you're also, um, Mm. entering into is, do we raise our children the way we were raised? So if, we're, if we were raised with critique all the time, we are going to tend to do that to the next generation. We also probably carry a harsh critique inside and we won't even be able to listen to or see who our children are because we are automatically and unconsciously repeating the treatment that we had. So if you think back, it's really transgenerational. All the way back, of course, it's transgenerational all the way forward too, which gives us a tremendous opportunity to change consciousness, awareness, lovingness, kindness. The world could use it, right? But the good choices we make today can be passed down for generations. True. Right? Equally, the bad choices that were made are passed on for generations as well. And so that absence that people take advantage, just take for granted, goes on for generations, unquestioned. The point is to question. The point is to understand why you're being nasty to your child or why you're being good to your child or why your child is being nasty to you. Because maybe they have a point. They want something that they're not getting. So let's sit down and figure it out. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people never learned how to communicate. And that's really the key, actually. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Let's say, well, well let's back up just a little bit. This, this, this idea that what, you know, that what we're doing as parents, 
um, can be passed on. And that, of course, our parents affected, affect us, but how can we change? Let's just say we came from a situation that was less than ideal. Yeah. And we want to, we want to make positive things go down through the rest generations, but we have this, we've come from a space where, Hey, I, you know, I've learned some things that weren't as positive. What kind of things can that person who's ready to say, I want to be a chain breaker. I want to change what was passed to me and be better. What kind of steps could that person do to what, what do you, what would you recommend well, somebody you do know, to try to change that chain? Yeah. Well, that's part of the whole profession of psychoanalysis and psychotherapy is, is that we don't really change with, we don't really change without a healthy therapeutic relationship. Some people can't do that. They don't have the means or whatever. Groups sometimes help. Organizations sometimes help because it be, it has become ingrained when there is a lot of negativity and a lot of lack, a lot of harshness, brutality. Uh, I'll bet you know a lot of people and they will say, as if it's a matter of course, everybody on my block was hit by their dad with the belt. Everybody did it. That's normal. No, no, that is not normal. Let's see how we can change it. So you can change it by inner reflection. You can change and really taking yourself seriously. You change it by can be discussing with one's partner where you're in trouble, your obstacles psychologically. Go for help, counseling, therapy, analysis, join a group be in an organization and get way in to the uncomfortable areas. And the problem is that we tend to avoid, you know, we, a lot of people, they have all kinds of addictions, compulsions that keep them from taking care of themselves. So I think that each person, as they can go inside and evaluate their life, what they're about, why are they doing this or that, it helps because everyone you encounter will be somehow changed by your increased awareness of yourself. I like that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, re I read something recently about when you're trying to change a habit, for example, let's talk about habits, which is not quite the same thing, but we'll, mm -hmm. we'll talk about this. The initial amount of energy almost can be likened to taking a rocket and blasting it into space. You know, when you're taking a rocket and, and you're trying to get out of that gravitational pull, they burn more fuel in that first few minutes than they burn. Um, once they're out in space, they can go millions of miles with less fuel than it takes them just to get out of the earth's pull. And sometimes these habits that we have, and sometimes, as you said, conscious and unconscious things that have been passed down. When we say, you know what, I'm going to change this thing that I've been doing for a long, long time that I may have just learned, I may be doing it. There's a lot of effort that comes in to changing something. Mm -hmm. But once we, we do the work, once we do the work to say, Hey, you know what? I am going to make this new change, this habit. It, it's almost like you've got out of the gravitational pull and you're heading towards the moon. You know, it's a lot less energy than it is just getting off the ground. Yeah. Yeah, but but um, the energy then can be used to continual, continue the awareness because you right. can't just glide on saying, oh yeah, I got out of the gravitational pull. You want to stay on the course you want to stay on. The difficulty, I think, when there has been an absent of a father um, would be that, you know, you've got a blank space there. So it's how do you create a different habit when there's no space? On the other hand, there are models like people down the street, a neighbor, a teacher, a figure in a book, on video, some game that one is playing. So there are father figures around that can be very helpful to get us into the right um, root, but we get to create ourselves. When there's all that absence, we have to create ourselves.
So we are our own rocket. We are our own. Yeah. And you've got the fuel. You've got, you're the rocket. You can, you can do this. That's exactly right. Yes. Susan, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you feel we would need to share with our viewers today? That's just really important. I appreciate these tips, the importance of being a father. You know, actually, I I just thought of one thing that I do want to ask you that that we may have not touched on. Talk about today. There are so many distractions, especially in the forms of our cell phones, digital distractions. And so sometimes people are sitting in the same room together. So they're physically present, but everyone's on a device. They're on an iPad. They're not even presently physically there. How can we overcome that? I mean, what do you recommend you know, for yeah, fathers and family, I mean, how how do you recommend that this yeah, overcome this? Yeah, you know, I think it's important because we can't deny that uh, the phones and the tablets and everything else can't deny it. It's already gone over, so that's our life, and it will change more actually. But if every single day we set aside a time to sit together, maybe it's at dinner, sit together and we talk. Nobody's on their, no one's on their phones. We just do it. We do it because we respect each other. We don't do it because it is the rule of the father. No, we do it because it would be great for us. And then after, we're not going to be, so maybe half an hour we spend together. Let's do it. Or maybe on a, a, a morning on the weekend, we do some chores together, or we hang out together. We go on a hike. We take a walk together, no phones. Let's just talk. You know, it just bits. It, it's like respecting the otherness of the other people. Let's show each other who we are. You know, it's if you model it, kids will follow. They'll like it. They, you know, even though they're used to phones from the day they're born almost now, truly. But um, they would appreciate the time, not the rule, but the time to. The time. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. You know, I had an aunt one time when when you were talking to her, if the phone would ring on the other side of the room, she wouldn't even look at it. She wouldn't walk over and look at it. She wouldn't say, well, let me just check this for a minute. She, it was almost like it was just birds chirping in the background (laughs) and she was so good at it because you would just feel really important because what you're really saying is you're more important to me right yeah. here. Yeah. And whoever's trying to get a hold of me, they can wait. I'm here with you. Yeah. And this is the moment I need. And so if it's too hard to do that, maybe it's a good idea to just put your phone in the closet, put it in the back room, put it somewhere where you can't see it so that you can be present with your children while you're there with them. So it's not like I'm here, but I'm uh, somebody dinged in or my Facebook feed or my Twitter feed or, or somebody who's texting me or the next email. I mean those can wait. Childhood won't come again. Be there for your children and let the people, you can deal with them when the kids are asleep maybe, but right now let's be present, right? Yes. But let me also add that the parent wants to also be present themselves. It's not just to model for the children. It's the experience of feeling what it is to really be oneself and to share oneself with the people that are close to you. So it's it's very complex and very simple at the same time. Well, oh, thank you. That's that's very, very, very profound. Is there is there anything else you'd like to say? And I apologize. I asked you that and then I cut you off. So tell no, I just, would, like I just yeah, I would like to just add that even though there's absence, there is of course hope. And I think that that's what I would really want to convey and hope to understand oneself, be able to respect one's conscious and unconscious life, as well as those of others, and to be very mindful, you know, of really what's going on and how we are sharing ourselves with openness. Okay, that's what Thank I- you. Thank you for sharing, Susan. What an honor to have you on the show today. Thank, Thank you. you. How can people reach out to you if they want to get a hold of you? Yes, um, my website is www.susanschwartzphd.com. The book is Absent Father, Effect on Daughters, Father Desire, Father Wounds. 
and it's sold from Rootledge, Amazon, and everything else. And um, I have another one next year, this year, the as if personality, the imposter syndrome. So there's that too. And uh, they can get a hold of me on my email, sesphd at cox.net. And thank you for being such a wonderful host. I appreciate it. Thank you, Susan, for taking the time to be on our show today. We're, we're honored to have you. And feel free to reach out to Susan. And remember to be present. I love the message here today. Be present, be there, be an involved dad. And for those of you who didn't have that, there is hope. Appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Have a good one. I am so jealous of my wife because she gets the ultimate career. She gets to train and nurture and love our children more than I get to because I have to be doing things like this podcast. Parenting is the ultimate career. If you like what you heard today, please like, subscribe, comment, leave a review. Thank you for listening. You can also check out my book, What I Want My Children to Know Before I Die. It's available on Amazon and other bookstores. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>